Hey, everybody. Glad you guys are here with us. We are in the midst of a series. Today, we're actually wrapping up a series where we're learning about how to deal with the trust issues that we all have. And we trust people too quickly, we trust people too slowly, we trust the wrong people, we refuse to trust the right people. So we've been learning in this series how to not only overcome our trust issues, to trust trustworthy people, but to be trustworthy people ourselves. And today we're going to talk about what do you do when trust is broken? Because we know that trust is hard to build, but easy to break. And we know that at some level, we all break one another's trust. So what do you do when trust is broken? Growing up, I'm of the generation whose moms fed us breakfast and said, now get out of the house and don't come back until the street lights come on. Don't come back until dark. That's my generation. And so whenever it rained or was too hot to go outside in the heat of the summer, my mom would give us breakfast and say, now go play, but don't bother me all day. And so one of the things we would do to play and not bother mom all day, we would build card houses. Out of playing cards, we'd build houses, hotels, villages, the whole thing. This was pre-internet, pre-Roblox. This is old man Roblox, friends. That's what it is. And so we would build card houses and all over the place, wherever we could in the house. And in one wagging tail of a dog, that whole house could come down. Or in one move of a mean big brother, that house could come down. And I look at the tumbling image of a card house, and I think about trust in that way. Because trust takes a long time to build, and you're careful as you build it. But one misstep, one wrong action, one mistake, even one accident can break trust. And what do you do when everything comes tumbling down? How do you rebuild trust? That's what we're going to talk about today. And I've got some bad news. Sometimes trust is broken and it's replaced with betrayal. And I've got some good news. Broken trust can be repaired. The bad news is trust is broken and we betray people. The good news is in many cases... Broken trust, betrayal, can be repaired. And because there are levels of betrayal, because there's a spectrum of betrayal, because there's degrees of betrayal, let's start out with a common understanding of what it means to betray someone. In his book on trust, Dr. Henry Cloud said that betrayal is any time we don't consider someone else's needs when we make decisions. Wow, I've betrayed a lot of people, if that's the definition of betrayal. He says that betrayal also is any time we take action, even if we know it has negative consequences on others. Like there's a spectrum of betrayal. On the most minor of betrayals, the fast food restaurant doesn't get your order right. You know what it feels like to be angry and betrayed as a kid? When they didn't remove the onions from my Happy Meal, all of a sudden that was an unhappy meal. I know what it's like to be betrayed by a fast food place. Then there's the extreme of betrayal that you think about in marriage when a spouse cheats on another. And the level of betrayal and the heartache is the difference between those two is huge. But in between, there's other levels of betrayal. How about when that coworker that you've invested in, poured your life into, leaves your company, takes what you taught them and starts a competitive company in your community? You feel that betrayal. How about when you have a friend that you trust and they share your secret with someone else? We warned against gossip last week, but it, it's a reality that you feel betrayed when others share what you shared with them. And so on this spectrum of trust, I want you to see how to rebuild trust, no matter how it's broken. And I'm gonna give you six things to consider today. You say, Mike, six things? Yes, six things to consider today as you look at how to rebuild trust when trust is broken. 
Because it's possible to trust again. And it's possible to be trusted again. The first thing to consider is this. When you've been betrayed, heal from what happened to you. If you've been betrayed, you need two things. You need time and you need space. You need time and space so that you heal from what has happened to you. Like a pro athlete, when they're injured, what do they take? They take time out from their sport and they take space to recover. Time and space are needed. When you're betrayed, you're gonna be tempted to take action immediately. You're gonna be tempted to lash out in hurt and anger. You're gonna be tempted to lash out in revenge. When you've been betrayed, you're gonna wanna act, but don't because broken people break things. And in that moment of your being betrayed, you feel broken. And don't allow your feelings to fool you into acting too early. You need time and space. Because when you take time and space when you're betrayed, what you get is perspective. You get a perspective that says, like Proverbs 19 verse 11, a person's wisdom yields patience. It's to one's glory to overlook an offense. In our world and in your life, you and I have a choice to make. How offended do we get when we feel betrayed? How offended do we get when we are betrayed unquestionably? How patient will we be in our response? How wise will we be in our worldview? Because there are many times that we are betrayed that if we lived this verse, it's to your glory to overlook the offense. It's to your glory to not let this become an issue in your life. It's to your glory to work through this personally without moving through the other five things I'm gonna walk you through today. Much of the betrayal we experience in our world can be dealt with right here. Taking time and taking space instead of reacting. Because many of us, if we take time and space, we understand that this isn't worth the heartache. This isn't worth being outraged over. In a world that is so easily offended, I wish Christians would grow a thicker skin and say, it's to my glory to overlook this offense. My wisdom says I'm going to be patient. And when you're patient, you don't have to respond. You don't have to engage. You simply can get time and space and deal with the question, do I have to deal with this or can I overlook it? Do I have to walk through this trust rebuilding process? Or can I just overlook this and move on? Because I've got time and space and perspective. If you say, Mike, I can't move on from this when it's not minor like a restaurant messing up my order, then what do you do? Second thing you need is to move towards forgiveness and beyond anger. You need to move toward forgiveness even when forgiveness feels impossible and unfair and even wrong at the time. Even when you don't want to forgive them, not forgiving them only hurts you or me in the long run. Sir Walter Scott said, revenge is the sweetest morsel to the mouth that was ever cooked in hell. And you and I, when we're betrayed, must begin to move away and beyond, away from and beyond anger and toward forgiveness. And forgiveness is not foregoing your emotions. In fact, you might have to get emotional to get to the point of forgiveness. You might have to get angry before you move to the point where you realize, I need to forgive. Ephesians says, in your anger, do not sin. So if your anger prompts you to forgive, your anger is doing its work. In his book, Trust, 
Dr. Cloud says that God designed the human system to emotionally process every injustice. So you allow yourself to feel, you allow yourself to express, but in your feeling, in your expression, in your anger, do not do anything to damage yourself or others. In your anger, do not sin. Because forgiveness is the only path to your freedom from betrayal. Forgiveness is the only path. So don't act out on your betrayal. Work it out. Don't act out when you're betrayed. Talk it out and move beyond anger and toward forgiveness. And here's the amazing thing, because some of you say, Mike, I don't know that I could forgive them because they haven't asked to be forgiven. Mike, I don't know that I could forgive them. They don't deserve my forgiveness. Mike, I don't know. I've been betrayed. I don't know if I can forgive them because of what they've done. Well, do you realize, and we celebrated at Easter, that it only takes one person to do the work of forgiveness? It only takes one person to forgive Romans 5, verse 8, the Bible says, While we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. One man did the work of forgiveness for every man, woman, and child. You and I must learn the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. And we'll see that in just a moment. One man did the work to forgive the whole world through his death, burial, and resurrection. One man did the work to forgive. You can do the work to forgive those who have betrayed you. And Jesus didn't wait till we could be right with him to forgive us because we couldn't be right with him without his forgiveness. Jesus didn't wait for us to believe in him and put our faith in him before he died for us because it's impossible for us to do. And so we look and we say, let Jesus be our model. Offer forgiveness freely but reconcile when it's appropriate. Reconcile when you've been responded to appropriately. So number three in this rebuilding trust process, first, you're gonna move toward, first, you're gonna heal from what happened, second, you're gonna move toward forgiveness, and then third, you're gonna consider what you really want. As your heart is softening, and as you've got time and space and you're healing up, you're gonna consider what you want. You've been betrayed, you've been hurt. You've betrayed someone, you've hurt them. So the question becomes, what do I really want out of this relationship? What is the best case scenario from where I am now to where I wanna be? Maybe your spouse has an addiction issue and you look and say, they've betrayed me again because of their addiction. The best case scenario for me right now is for them to get healthy. The best case scenario for me right now is for us to prioritize their health, physically, spiritually, emotionally. Maybe you've been betrayed by a friend and you look and you say the best case scenario is sometime down the road, I can trust them again. The best case scenario, if a teenager has betrayed you, is to say sometime down the road, I will allow them to have the freedom that they want. Sometime down the road, I see a picture of this wrong being made right. And you and I must know that we look and see what's the best outcome. What do we want to accomplish? Is this worth fighting for? There are some friendships that you've been fighting for for years and years and years and years, and it might be time to move along because it's not just worth the work anymore. There are some family relationships that we continue to fight in over and over and over again because we're bound to each other. But even in those relationships, we look and say, what's the best case scenario? Because if you decide to trust again, think about this with me. If you decide to trust again, that is a bad choice on both sides. Because if you decide to trust again, and many times I hope you do, most times I hope I do, right along with you. If you decide to trust again, it's a, it's a bad choice. Because you could be betrayed again, 
That's a bad choice to make. You could be hurt again. That's a bad choice to make. And on the other side of that coin, we know that even if we're not betrayed, even if we're not hurt again, even if everything goes exactly as we hope it will, the other bad choice is it's going to require some work from me. I'm going to have to do some things to rebuild trust with this person, with this company, with this church, with these people. I'm going to have to do some things to rebuild trust. So either, here's my choice when I decide to trust again. Either I get betrayed because this doesn't work out, or I have to do some hard work along with them so that trust can be rebuilt. It's a difficult decision on both sides. So I want to encourage you, if you've been hurt and you feel like you have no choice, you do have a choice. You can decide again to do the hard work of trusting. You can decide again to dig in and get to work. And, and I want you to watch out for people that are pushing you in one direction or the other. Because you're always gonna have friends and family who tell you what you want to hear in these situations instead of what you need to hear. So I want you to watch out for people that push you in one direction or another, but instead, I want you to be drawn to people who seek to understand you. I want you to be drawn to people who say, I'm here with you and for you, and I'm praying for you, and I'm walking with you through this. So number three, we look and see, what is it that we really want? And then number four, we figure out if restoration and reconciliation is available. What you're calling here while you're figuring out what this relationship looks like in the future is a ceasefire. And if you're ever in a relationship where all you're doing is arguing, if you're in a season in marriage where all you're doing is fighting, I really think a ceasefire is a wise thing to call. A timeout is needed sometimes in marriage so that we don't keep fighting over and over and over again. I know some couples who when they're in that challenging season, will actually schedule peace talks so that they sit down and talk through their stuff and work through their issues so that trust can be built again. I encourage you a couple of things on those peace talks. Have them for a set amount of time. I encourage you a few ways in these peace talks. Have them in public. So that way you talk through things and work through things, but you manage your emotions and you keep from attacking one another. But as you look at the relationship where trust has been broken, you have to figure out, is reconciliation even available? And this is when you stop looking at your heart and your mind, and you start looking to see how they responded. First is this, what's the offending party doing? Do they recognize that they've done wrong? If they have recognized they've done wrong and they're repentant, that shows something about the potential of reconciliation with them. Is the offending party seeking forgiveness? That's the ultimate responsibility when someone betrays us. When your friend talks about you and betrays your confidence and they realize it, do they come and say, will you forgive me? Are they doing the hard work in this relationship? And, and as you look at whether or not reconciliation is possible, you look at them and then you also consider whether or not you're willing to truly offer forgiveness to them. Because the three most powerful words in a broken relationship are will you forgive me? Those are four words. Will you forgive me? The three most powerful words in any relationship, will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? When someone has betrayed you and they come to you with a sense of ownership and they come to you not defending themselves but they come realizing that they have offended you and they say, will you forgive me? Walk back towards that person. Work to trust that person again. It's one of the things that my wife, if she was talking to you about our relationship over the almost last 30 years, and on the level of betrayal, I've never betrayed her in the worst ways, but I've betrayed her in other ways. Not thinking about her first, 
not considering her needs, not filtering my words, not choosing my jokes. I have betrayed her in many ways, never the worst way. But she would tell you that what causes her to love me through those moments is that when I have hurt her, I get soft very quickly. And I learn very quickly. And I do what it takes to make things right, and I'm committed to our relationship. Now, she would probably also tell you there are some things that he's still learning very slowly on. Like, I'm not perfect by any means. But if you see someone that isn't defensive but owns their stuff, and you see someone that is asking for your forgiveness, because with forgiveness from your side and clear ownership from their side, with repentance, the work to trust again can be done. But I also know that you're gonna be dealing with people that might not get soft when they've done wrong, that might get defensive, that might get angry themselves, that might try and deflect, that might be narcissistic, that might try and gaslight you. We talked about these people last week. Is reconciliation possible with them? Well, Romans 12, the Bible teaches us in verse 18 this, life-giving truth. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. There are some people that you work this process with and it will not lead to trusting relationships again. You're not responsible for their response. As far as it's possible with you, live at peace with others. If you do the right thing and they refuse your olive branch, your offer of peace, as far as it's possible with you, you've done all you can. But if you keep moving in this process with a person that is owning their stuff and repentant and broken over what they did, the fifth thing you do is this. You assess the trustworthiness to determine if trust is an option. And as we look at trust, most of us see trust as though it's an on-off switch. Most of us see trust as it's either I either trust them or I don't. The power's on or the power's off. But in reality, trust is more like a dimmer switch or the lights are going up and down at varying degrees where you can change the ambiance in a room with the slide of a dimmer or the turn of a dimmer. In our trusting relationships, realize that even when trust is low, there is still trust there. And you can assess whether or not that person is trustworthy. And throughout this series, we've been looking at the Proverbs together. And the Proverbs are the wisdom literature in the Bible that instruct us how to live our lives wisely. And in the Proverbs, there are three types of people. And as you look at the three types of people that we deal with, this will help you know whether or not this person is trustworthy. The first type of person in Proverbs is the wise person. And this is a person that's living what they're learning from the Lord. This is a person that is humble. This is a person that's repentant and broken. This is a person, they're not perfect, but they're growing. Trust wise people. There's also a person in the Proverbs known as the fool. In fact, most Proverbs are a contrast between the wise person, the one who's quick to listen, the one who's slow to speak, the one who's seeking restoration. Most Proverbs are a contrast between the wise and the foolish. The wise person and the fool. The fool denies responsibility. The fool blames you. The fool has no empathy. The fool has no remorse. There's wise people and there's foolish people according to the Bible. Some of you are saying, Mike, I've got a third category. And let me tell you, the Bible has a third category as well. And that's an evil person. That's a person that seeks to actively hurt or harm you. That's a person that's actively trying to destroy you. And if you're in a relationship with an evil person, you should not continue trusting that person at any level. It is godly to test the trustworthiness of people and if they are evil and seek to hurt and harm you, in the name of Jesus, may you seek safety. 
And may you protect your heart and may you protect your life. Because somebody can be foolish and not actively trying to hurt you. Someone can be wise and accidentally hurt you or make a mistake. But if they are evil and actively trying to hurt you, there is no reason to walk back. If they're evil and trying to take you down, I encourage you to do what Jesus says to determine which of these three people you might be dealing with. Jesus says in Matthew 10, verse 16, I'm sending you out like a sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. In the context here, Jesus was sending his disciples out to do ministry. He said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. What do wolves do to sheep? They devour them. What do wolves do to sheep? They consider them a nice lunch or dinner, correct? And Jesus said, I'm sending you out among people that would seek to hurt and harm you, would devour you. So I want you to be as wise as a serpent and as gentle as a dove. I want you to wisely look at people. Don't let your feelings fool you when you look at people. Be as wise as a serpent, but be as gentle as a dove. And I love the contrast there because there's nothing gentle about a serpent. But Jesus says, I want you to be as wise as a serpent. And I want you to do things the right way with the right heart to be gentle as a dove. So when you evaluate people, it requires, when you look to see the trustworthiness of people, it requires wisdom and discernment on your part. And it requires that you also check your heart and make sure that you are treating them with loving kindness, even if they don't deserve it. You're treating them with love and kindness because that's what you've been treated with. Even if you have to love them from a distance, you are coming as wise and as shrewd as a snake and as innocent as a dove. And then the last thing we look to rebuild trust the last thing we look for, the last thing we do to rebuild trust is that we look for evidence of real, lasting change. Because if you're in a relationship with someone who betrays you and you take the time and space that you need, you offer forgiveness to them, you draw a picture of this is the best case scenario for this relationship, I decide I'm gonna reconcile in this relationship, I see that they're a wise person and we're working the process together that might take months to do what I just said in minutes. That might take a year or two, what I just said in a minute. But where you see change over time, recognize it, celebrate it. Where you see change over time, remember that change is always possible. In Philippians chapter three, the apostle Paul gives us a picture of what it looks like to let the past be the past. Because at some point in your relationship, if someone has betrayed you and you decide to live in a relationship with them in the future, you must let the past be the past. Philippians three thirteen and 14, the Bible says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on to the goal to win the prize for which Christ Jesus has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Man, I made up some words in that passage, but I think y'all can read better than I can. There comes a point in time when you must do the one thing the Apostle Paul says, and I love, Paul says, I want you to do one thing, then he lists out three things. He says, I want you to do one thing. I want you to forget what's behind. There comes a point in time when people show you that they're trustworthy and their track record has corrected their betrayal from the past, that you must forget what's behind and you strain towards what is ahead. That's the second thing you do. You keep doing the work. And then third, you never forget the ultimate goal is we're both becoming more like Jesus in our relationships. Whether it's a friendship, whether it's a marriage, 
whether it's a parenting relationship or a coworker relationship, the ultimate goal in life is that we press on to the goal of Christ likeness. And we press on to the goal of honoring him before we get to heaven. So you're gonna have some people that when they betray your trust, they're gonna give you two words and watch out for these people. Some people, when they betray your trust, are gonna say, trust me. Why is it that we struggle to trust people that say, trust me? Because they're wanting their words to cover their betrayal instead of their lives to prove that they know they've done wrong. So when somebody says, trust me, I watch closely. I'm careful. When somebody says, watch me, when someone says, I'm, I'm all in, I'm working the process. When someone says, watch me instead of trust me, and I can see the progression over time, then I know that can, trust can, and perhaps trust even has been rebuilt with that person. As I talk to you today, I know that a message like this can unearth all sorts of feelings of Betrayal from the past or the present. I know that this type of message can unearth all kinds of issues as you look and you say, I really got some hurt in my life that I'm still carrying. And my hope and prayer is for you that you would allow the love and grace and mercy of God to minister to you as we pray together. And that the feelings that you're experiencing, the things that we may have unearthed today, that you will allow God to minister to your soul and work in your life because you might have been betrayed in the past, but there comes a point when you need to let the past be the past. And by the power of his grace, you can forget what is behind and press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of you. Trust is hard to build and it's easy to break. That's why we the, need the good news that you can rebuild trust in, our, in your relationships. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the chance to open your word and to learn and grow together. God, I pray you help us live what we're learning. God, help us to know the truth behind what's happening in our hearts. God, where we are betrayed, God, give us a thick skin. God, where we are offended, give us a thick skin. God, where we are angered, give us a thick skin so that we can be wise and patient. God, help us to not be offended by things that only are a distraction. God, help us to not be offended by things that match the culture of our day. God, help us to not be offended. But God, at the same time, where we have been betrayed, where we have been hurt, God, help us to feel it in such a way that we will process it and move toward forgiveness. Help us to feel it in such a way that we'll look to see the quality of our relationships and the trustworthiness of people. God, I pray for that person that feels hopeless right now, that you would give them a best case scenario, a picture of what could be. Give them hope, Lord. And God, I pray for those that are in the midst of rebuilding trust. Whether they are on day one or day 366, Lord, I just pray for them that they would continue to do the hard work and continue to do what it takes to trust. And God, I pray for those that betray others, myself included, that we would all do the hard work of confessing our sin to you, repenting of our sin, in doing the work of living in healthier, better relationships. God, none of us are innocent. So God, help us all be men and women of uprightness and integrity. As the church prays, if you're gathered with us today and you've never put your faith in Jesus, I invite you to make today your day. The Bible says that we're all sinners in need of a savior and that we can't solve our own sin problem. And our sin has separated us from God and broken our world. That's why God sent Jesus who gave his life and invites us to believe in him, to find our life. And when we believe in Jesus, we're forgiven of our sins 
Heaven becomes our home and we become new creations in Christ. The old is gone and the new is here. If you've never put your faith in Jesus and yet today you say, hey, I believe. I trust that what the Bible says about him is true. I trust that what the Bible says about me is true. I believe. If today is your day to believe, let's mark that moment so you'll never forget. You can pray, Jesus, I believe. I believe that I'm a sinner who needs a savior and that you are the savior of the world. Thank you for coming for me, for dying in my place and being raised again from the dead. Today, I believe. Thank you for giving me life. If today was your day to believe you are a new creation, you're a son or a daughter of the most high, heaven is your forever home, and we encourage you to let us know that today was your day to believe. Pick up a new believer's kit, use a response card in front of you, let us know that today was the day. Tell the friend that brought you. Father, as we pray, we pray that you would be pleased with all of our response to you. As we give our heart, we give our lives, we give our song, we give our offering, may you be pleased in it all. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.